Attorney General Barr nails the crazy left. Trump to testify over impeachment. FedEx gets called out by the New York Times, but FedEx claps back. Prince Andrew does a disastrous interview. Blasey Ford gets an ACLU award and Charlie's Angels flops. We got that and more coming up. Welcome to the Buck Saxon Show, everybody. Thank you for being here with me. It's a bit of a cold and dreary Monday in New York City, hopefully a little more charming wherever you are across the country and around the world. But the good news is when it's not beautiful and sunny outside, there is no better place to be than in the Freedom Hut here with producer Mark, who even on the darkest days is a ray of sunshine for all of us. So let's get to what I wanted to, what I, uh, wanted to begin our deep dive into all things that matter today with, and that is the Attorney General speaking over the weekend. Now, we have all of this focus on the impeachment proceedings, and more witnesses this week. Vinman is going to be one of them. There are a few other witnesses. I believe an aide to Vice President Pence will speak. And there is a clear idea from the Democrats and the left of what's supposed to happen here, which is that the steady drumbeat of witness, 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 polls that are negative for the president, witnesses that are negative for the president, that this will shape opinion over time. Even if you don't view this or you haven't viewed this from the beginning as a worthwhile exercise, you feel like they're trying to make this allegation against the president seem much more damaging than it really is. They're hyping this whole thing up. Even if you feel that way, certainly I do, and and then some, even stronger, even more strongly than I've described there, the media understands that part of the effect of propaganda is to shift opinion through repetition. One of the things that they can accomplish is just by saying day in and day out, the president's going to be, the president should be impeached, he's going to be impeached, the public is against the president, people start to even subconsciously say to themselves, wow, I guess there really is a, a means for, uh, or there really is a, a necessity for impeachment here. And remember, they're not going to convince you and me, or at least those of you who, like me, are very supportive of the president, despite understanding his flaws. What they're hoping is that they can just edge up enough of the opposition to the president from the roughly 40 percent of liberals who will believe anything about Trump, will do anything to get rid of Trump, to get it just above the, you keep saying these polls, the 51 percent mark. They're hoping that if they can manage that accomplishment, then there'll be enough of a groundswell to get rid of this president. Um, And perhaps not through the removal proceeding by the Senate after a Senate trial, but that he will go into re-election wounded in the court of public opinion. He will go into re-election with a a newly emboldened left-wing opposition against him and a somewhat uh, chastened, demoralized Trump support. That is the purpose of all of this. That's what they have been saying all along. But I, I wanted to take a step back from this for a minute because part of the justification of the impeachment proceeding uh, part of wh- whatever we're now it's now it's full impeachment it was an inquiry wh- whatever they're calling this now now the impeachment investigation is that the president has been so terrible that he has shredded the constitution this is what you often hear he has been shredding the norms that really hold this country politically culturally legally together and that there's really a and they're making an argument that it is the totality of all things Trump that is impeachable. It's not even just any one specific act. Of course it can't be. They keep changing what that specific act would be with every passing week, with each passing day in some cases. Emoluments Clause, Russia collusion, quid pro quo, uh, 25th Amendment. Uh, just go, go down the list of all these different things that they say they're going to either use or will be the justification for using uh, as a means of getting rid of the president. It's a, it's a cycle, it's a rotation, it's this, it's that, it's this, it's that. And now you're seeing that to hold all this together, to be the overarching theme for the series of narratives about Trump being reckless and destroying the country, uh, is that 
he is destroying the norms. He is shredding uh, the rule of law. And what I really liked is that this week at Attorney General Barr, who you know is effective because the left hates him. And this is a guy who's a very yeah, pretty uh, laid back, I'd say, in his demeanor. Uh, a lawyer's lawyer was in the specifically in the part of the Justice Department before where the lawyers who evaluate what is what is department policy, what is constitutional, what is not. So he's a brilliant lawyer. They keep saying he's a hatchet man for Trump, even though he had already been attorney general and there was no one saying he was a hatchet man then. Then uh, he's a brilliant lawyer, though. He spoke at the Federalist Society over the weekend and it was a brilliant speech. I know a lot of you aren't going to have the time to watch the whole hour and 30 minutes or so of it. But I would tell you, you could just jump to the latter portion, the last 30 minutes or so, where he really gets into the meat of what's going on right now of the way the resistance is waging its campaign against the president and how it is they who are trashing the rule of law. They're the ones who are discarding norms and engaging in a scorched earth campaign against the president. And this one, we've got a couple moments here, uh, but first he gets into the tactics of the left and then he will get into who really, who, who are the left these days? And when I use that term, we get the phrase, but first let's start with the tactical approach. This was a brilliant summation from a fantastic lawyer who knows what the president is up against, who's on the front lines as the attorney general of the judicial overreach that is a tool against the president. They're pretty open about it. The hashtag resistance judiciary. Here's the attorney general saying it for himself. Please play clip two. Unfortunately, just in the past few years, we have seen this con these conflicts take on an entirely new character. Immediately after President Trump won election, opponents inaugurated what they called the resistance. And they rallied around an explicit strategy of using every tool and maneuver to sabotage the functioning of the executive branch and his administration. The fact of the matter is that in waging a scorched earth, no holds barred war of resistance against this administration. It is the left that is engaged in the systematic shredding of norms and undermining the rule of law. Every American needs to hear that speech. A lot of them will disagree, say that Barr is just a tool of Trump. This is the crux of what we are seeing right now with impeachment with the Democrat and the left's war on this president, abusing the bureaucracy, weaponizing the intelligence community, usurping executive authority through the judicial branch. This is what they are doing. And it is, in fact, very much out of the Saul Alinsky playbook. This goes back to the community organi the origins of, of community organizers and doing things that while not explicitly illegal, are meant to use the system against itself to shut it down. We'll get into uh, universal injunctions, which the Attorney General speaks about at some length in just a few minutes. That's one of the primary methods of, of sabotage used against this administration. Judges have been essential in this process to the left, and they've been acting in bad faith, and their decisions are appalling, and they do violence to the rule of law while saying they are protecting the rule of law. But the systematic shredding of norms and undermining the rule of law is what the left has completely embraced in the era of Trump. And they accuse us, they accuse our side of doing that. They're the ones who say that this president is a fascist. This president's an authoritarian. Meanwhile, there are 600 judges on the on the federal bench from what Barr said in his speech if you count them all up you know all the different judges circuit judges and uh, federal judges across the country any one of them has been able to shut down administration policy at any point in time it's it's appalling what they have been doing how could anyone have faith that the rule of law is universally applicable to all people in this country that the justice system isn't just now a series 
of excuses used by the left to get what they want when they want it. That's what the system has delivered. Or to undermine the system and say that it's biased, it's unfair. The ideology of intersectionality, the Marxism underlying all of this on the left, is a constant excuse for, well, the very system itself is imbalanced. One day, it's we have to do whatever the system says when they like it. When the election have, when Obama wins the election, it's elections, elections have consequences. When Trump wins the election, it's let's get rid of the Electoral College. Let's add seats to the next president who's a Democrat uh, so that they can stack the Supreme Court. Then all of a sudden, institutions don't matter. And they keep doing this. And they, they seem to think that we don't recognize, but we do recognize, we understand that they want what they want. But perhaps even more important in some ways than when Barr illustrated the processes by which the left is undermining the processes of government, the ways in which they are duplicitous when they talk about institutions and rule of law, how it's not serious, it's not rooted in principle, it's completely the system a la carte. Some days they want to order this, some days they want to order that. It doesn't matter what they did the day before. Barr also understands why liberals feel this way. What is it about the left-wing mentality? And this is true. This is the, the primary psychological, emotional motivation that the left has for so many of the policies, really for the, uh, for the majority of the primary issues that you look at today that this country faces. Why does the left take the approach that it does? What is, their, what is their governing philosophy, or rather, what is their philosophy of life that makes them want to leverage the government so that it can control every aspect of life? Why do they want this? Why does the left think this way? Well, the attorney general, in his speech, nailed it. Please play this remark, clip three. In any age, the so-called progressives treat politics as a religion. Their holy mission is to use the coercive power of the state to remake man and society in their own image according to an abstract ideal of perfection. Whatever means they use are therefore justified because by definition they are virtuous people pursuing a deific end. They are willing to use any means necessary to gain momentary advantage in achieving their end, regardless of the collateral consequences and the systemic implications. They never ask whether the action they take could be justified as a general rule of conduct equally applicable to all sides. When the left has power, it must be utilized in service of this mission of the deification of man through government. Government will make us better than we would otherwise be. But whatever power is used to that end is, is inherently justified. But when people that don't agree with their government ends are in power, then that same mentality goes in reverse. It's no longer justifiable to use government, say, to protect individual freedoms to do less. Now it must be the case that anything is justified against that cause. If they can do anything they want because they know that if they have the power of government, they will make a utopia here in this country, then when people who disagree with them are in power, they must do in their own mind whatever they have to in order to wrest power away from those people to create the utopia that they have been promising. It is one of the best summations of left-wing thought, left-wing ideology I have ever come across. It is devastating in its truth, and it is necessary for all people, even leftists who will discount it, to hear, because it is what we face right now in this country. And now just turning for a moment to the, the specifics of how the process is used against the President of the United States and the ways that this is done in, in bad faith. I mentioned universal injunctions. I, when I was in D.C., spoke to 
some senior Department of Justice people about this behind closed doors on more than one occasion, and this has become a, a major frustration of the administration, uh, that this is really a perversion of the role of the courts, and that not only should the courts not be doing this as a general rule, there's a clear, a clear change in the attitude of left-wing judges appointed by left-wing politicians who think that just because they don't like a thing, they have the right to stop it from happening and find the flimsiest legal rationale, the flimsiest, uh, the Administrative Procedure Act or some other such utter nonsense not intended for the purpose that the left is using it. Here is the Attorney General speaking about those universal injunctions. Play 22. The court's indulgence of such claims, even if they are ultimately rejected, represents a serious intrusion on the president's constitutional prerogatives. The impact of these judicial intrusions on the executive responsibility have been hugely, hugely magnified by another judicial innovation, the nationwide injunction. First used in 1963 and sparingly since then until recently, these court orders enjoin enforcement of a policy not just as to the parties before the court, but nationwide against everybody. Now, since President Trump has taken office, district courts have issued over 40 nationwide injunctions against the government. By, comp by comparison, during President Obama's first two years, district courts had issued two nationwide injunctions, both of which immediately vacated by the Ninth Circuit. <laughs> it is no exaggeration to say that virtually every major policy of the Trump administration has been subjected to immediate freezing by the lower courts. No other president has been subjected to such sustained efforts to, to debil de de debilitate his agenda. Sabotage by judges in the name of the very system that they are using for the sabotage. It's appalling. A 20x increase in universal injunctions from federal judges, from Obama to Trump over the same period. Does anyone think that that's an accident? You might say, well, then what, why, why is it that this happens in this way? Because the left go back to the justification for all of their actions that he gave. The deification, the deification uh, of the state and the people in it through government power. How can you compete with that? Welcome back, team. So, so as I was saying about universal injunctions, the basis for this is flimsy enough as it is because initially you would think that it would just enjoin the two parties in court, but what ends up happening is someone brings, they, they go jurisdiction shopping, usually it is the Ninth Circuit, and for pure reasons of policy difference, they will bring this suit in a federal court, and any federal judge can just say, I forbid the Trump administration from doing this thing anywhere in the federal jurisdiction of the United States, and until an appeals court comes along, until it makes its way up the chain, that is the way the system works right now. The only way to go around it, the only way to deal with it would be if Trump did do something that would start to kick a little bit at the load-bearing walls of the very separation of powers that we have and say, well, we're just going to ignore the court. That could happen. Some might argue even that that's a, nece uh, a necessary thing to happen on some of these issues, but that would clearly create a standoff, and people would start to ask, well, who, which branch of government is correct in this one? Um, the decisions that are being made, by the way, these injunctions against Trump are wrong. Th that's one thing about it that's so interesting, is that they make their way up to higher levels in the courts, and uh, overwhelmingly, the Trump administration is victorious on this. You see this with the travel ban. Oh, remember the travel ban? That was what Sally Yates, the hashtag resistance Obama appointee interim attorney general, 
refused to enforce. She was so certain that the Trump administration was violating the Constitution that she disobeyed a direct order from the Commander-in-Chief as the acting Attorney General had to be fired. Turns out the Trump administration was correct on the merits that they're completely within their rights under executive power to have a temporary withdrawal of permission to come to the United States for aliens from countries that are harboring or have uh, terrorist issues. Turns out Trump was right. Do we, do we ever hear about how, well, why, why did, wait a second, how could the acting attorney general be so wrong? How could she be so ignorant of the law that she would disobey a direct order and turns out the order's lawful? Because she's hashtag resistant. She's also the same person who was involved in the pretext of setting up General Flynn, sending over FBI agents, pretending like they're colleagues and just working through a quick issue, and then, oh, maybe you lied to us. They changed the 302, the record of that FBI meeting, after the fact. Lisa Page, in fact, was the one who changed it. We remember what she thought about Trump and people who voted for Trump, people who worked for Trump. We're told that's all a coincidence, though. Nothing to see there. Oh, that was all a completely legitimate law enforcement effort. Universal injunctions are the hijacking of the judiciary for anti-Trump ends. That's what has happened in this country. It has slowed down Trump's agenda or people who are upset. And I was uh, I saw the headline today that with Drudge that there were less deportations under Trump than there were under Obama. Well, keep in mind that Obama not only did not have the judiciary taking away his powers as president of the United States because there are some left-wing judges who don't like him. They, in fact, would sit by and let him exceed his authority as commander-in-chief, exceed his executive powers, as he did when finally the, I believe it was the Fifth Circuit Court, had to say, no, you can't just use prosecutorial discretion, effectively, enforcement prioritization, another way of saying it, to not, not only let people stay in the country who are in violation of law. This is the whole dreamer thing. This is DACA, right? Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. You, not only is, is that, by the way, an, an abuse of executive discretion, but to say DAPA, now the parents as well. Well, what if the president just says, dreamers, you know, President Obama had said dreamers, the parents of dreamers, and anybody who knows somebody who's either a dreamer or a parent of a dreamer, you know, their their associates, they all get to stay in the country. That's just mass amnesty via executive fiat. Would that be okay? I, I assure you there are a lot of left-wing federal judges who would say yes, whatever you want to do, because they like it. It doesn't matter what the law means, what the system would produce if people who are dispassionate about the outcome looked at it. They want a certain outcome, they will justify a certain outcome. The ends justify the means. That is the approach of the American left Always. But to add insult to injury, Obama does this. The Fifth Circuit says, no, you can't do DAPA as well. You can't give people work permits and confer all these rights just because you feel like it in in contravention of congressional intent, which is there are immigration laws they have written that are supposed to matter. You can't just wipe that all away. It's an enormous actual abuse of executive discretion. Uh, Obama himself had said he did not have the authority to do this as a means of trying to pressure Congress to do something. And then they didn't, as is their right. And then Obama goes, yeah, well, I'll just do it anyway. Was anyone calling him a fascist in the paper? Was anyone saying he was an authoritarian? He was wiping away the laws of this country because he felt like it, because it was the right thing to do. That's what he usually says, the right thing to do. And then... To bring this full circle, an act of discretion by one executive is countermanded. The Trump presidency begins. Trump looks at this and says, all right, we're going to have to have some kind of a negotiation over immigration here, but I'm not going to continue this policy of my predecessor where he decided that under his discretion as the president of the United States, there would not there would be a top down order through the executive branch that these, these dreamers, as they are called, these young illegal aliens, n- not all that young now, but uh, that they wouldn't be prosecuted. Trump goes, well, no, we're not going to continue with this official policy of the government. 
And what do you know? A judge in California goes, nope, sorry. What Obama hath done, you cannot undo. How could any person justify this? How could anyone who calls themselves a lawyer, a legal scholar, a judge, somebody who is steeped in these issues, you would think, would really know what the implications are of this kind of emotion-based recklessness when it comes to the law? You would think that a judge would know better, but of course judges don't know better because they're getting what they want in the process, slowing it down. As a result, President Trump, because of federal judges in the state of California, or one federal judge in the state of California in particular, President Trump has had to continue for three years the policy of his predecessor on immigration that was rooted entirely in executive discretion. No act of Congress, no statute whatsoever, was an abuse of that discretion in the first place. And now judges say that Trump can't undo it because of the Administrative Procedures Act. You must be kidding me. This is why I tweeted out after Baghdadi was, uh, well, killed himself with our uh, operators, special forces operators or uh, Delta Force operators right on his trail. I said, I'll just give it a matter of a matter of hours before the Ninth Circuit overturns Baghdadi's killing under the Administrative Procedure Act. I mean, obviously, I'm making a joke, but. This is, this is farcical, this is preposterous, that people are being taught, and I know they are, in law schools, that what's going on right now is respecting the process and the law. They're destroying the law. They're destroying what's supposed to be applicable to both sides, power that one side has in a certain circumstance, the other side is supposed to have. There is no good faith anymore in the way they approach this administration, and I think going forward, you'll see this with any administration. It is just political total war, whatever they have to do to get what they want. However they have to push, whatever construct they have to come up with, the media will magnify their lies, their shoddy analysis, and say, oh no, this is what's great. Trump is a, Trump is a racist. Trump is an authoritarian. He's a fascist. Forget about the fact that it is, in, it is in fact the left that is willing to destroy this system in order to tear down the president of the United States. And it comes from even before Trump. The, uh, the case that he felt was the single greatest usurpation of executive authority was Boumediene, which had to do with the detainment of an all unlawful combatant during a time of war in the global war on terror when the courts came in to rule. The federal judiciary system decided that the President of the United States has to confer the same internal due process and legal rights to an unlawful combatant in a time of war as they would for somebody who was detained inside this country. Well, is there any area of the law where the President is supposed to have a greater degree of leeway and discretion to include mistakes and collateral damage than in repulsing foreign adversaries, foreign invasion, foreign attackers? And if you go back to the vision of the founders, this is why one of the reasons for an executive branch, which initially was going to be really almost an, an errand boy of the legislature, if you go back to the uh, before the Constitutional Convention. But one of the reasons for this creation was specifically because they knew that if you got, if all of a sudden the British invaded, as they did again, you need somebody who can give orders that will be executed to repulse that invasion and to defend the very political community that the Constitution is meant to protect and uphold. And now the courts are coming and saying, no, you, you can't do that. In fact, the courts tried to create in the whole mess over the so-called Muslim ban a universal right around the world to get into a U.S. court to challenge as a foreigner with no rights or ties whatsoever to the United States to challenge your uh, exclusion from the country based on executive authority. I mean, I know that, you know, it's easier to sit around and yell about the swamp and the, and the swamp rats and drain the swamp and MAGA and the wall and everything else. And look, I'm all for the, the cultural aspects of uh, and, and the communication aspects of the Trump vision because we have to win elections. So I'm not putting all that down. I'm just saying what is happening here, what is happening in the judiciary 
and with a left wing that views itself as inherently justified in taking any action, this has ramifications even beyond the Trump administration, and this is really, really important. They are corrupting, they are undermining some of the most powerful institutions in our government. They are imbalancing the balance of powers, intentionally so. They are proving to any American who's willing to open his or her eyes that they do not approach these issues with good faith. They do not care what the collateral damage is to the system. And as they do this, they claim they are saving the system. In the era of Trump, the left is willing to burn down the village of this American experiment in order to save it. That is what they are. They they may not recognize it as such. That is what they are doing. There is no person who could look at the way that they have been leveraging specifically the judiciary as a weapon, as a club to batter this Trump administration with and not say, how are we supposed to have faith in this institution going forward? This is also why it looms so large in the mind of the left, the prospect of not being able to count on a left of center Supreme Court, of not being able to count on an ultimate judicial body that will give them the most important policy and cultural and political victories that, they, that they've been wanting for decades. Many leftists feel like they can't live in an America where that's not the case. At least they'll say that openly. If they can't have a left of center court, a bunch of dictators in robes, deciding what will be in America, ir- irrespective of what the law actually says, then they no longer respect the law. This goes back to progressives, as the Attorney General said, treating politics as a religion with the holy mission to use the coercive power of the state to remake man and society in their own image according to an abstract ideal of perfection. Whatever means they use are therefore justified because by definition they are a virtuous people pursuing deific ends. For the left... The utopia they seek is the only justification for any means. We are seeing that play out in real time in this country, including in the weaponization of impeachment as an explicitly partisan tool. Why are we going to use the impeachment mechanism against this president? Why are the leftists, why are Nancy Pelosi walking around saying things that they must know to be untrue? They're not that stupid. They know what they're saying is a lie because anything to defeat Trump is inherently justified. Anything to hurt his chances at re-election or even to remove him from office has to be justified. My friends, this kind of absolutism is the wellspring of totalitarianism. Do not forget it. I think that what you're going to see in the next weeks to come is this president will be impeached, and he should be impeached. And he should be impeached because he has used his office to obstruct justice. He should be impeached because he is in violation of the emoluments clause of the Constitution, and where he has very blatantly, I mean, really incredibly, used his office to make more money for his family. And lastly, of course, he should be impeached because he has used national security aid to Ukraine in order to try to undermine a potential political opponent. And those are all grounds uh, for impeachment. Why have this whole sham of an investigation if somebody like Bernie Sanders, who's a sitting senator and who therefore will be called upon as this goes along to cast a vote in favor of removing the president of the United States, we really have to sit around and pretend that the Democrats haven't already made up their mind here? People like Nancy Pelosi look at us and say, wait, are we, we don't know if it's going to be impeachment or not. No, they're going to impeach this president. And if they could remove him, make no mistake about it, if they happen to have the two-thirds votes required 
in the Senate. By the way, I'm sure there'll be complaints about that, and they will start to say it should just be a bare majority, right? Just a basic majority in the Senate should be enough because then the Democrats would feel like they could probably pressure one or two, maybe three Republicans, switch. They'll be complaining about that part of the system because they complain about any part of the system that doesn't give them what they want. But if they're going to tell us that Trump is already guilty, why have this political trial? It's all a sham, folks. 